When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass-fed and grass-finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at ButcherBox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious, and all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. You know, I was actually just reflecting on the old truism, it's better to give than to receive um, this morning. And I think that like the data actually does bear that out, right? That when we give, we actually experience a lot of positive psychological effects in our brains. Um, But also it is a way that we are tied to other people. I think that we live in such a hyper individualistic society that we can think, okay, well, here I am with money and I'm going to give it to someone else in an organization that's supporting a cause or a group of people that that lacks. Um, but really, I think that in my work, I've seen that it's actually a two way street, that we are all sort of in community with each other, whether we recognize it or not. And it's a way for us to be connected, um, you know, emotionally invested uh, with our time and our resources into uh, other people's lives that can be good for us. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money Podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Are you more of a giver or a receiver? Okay, get your minds out of the gutter. I'm talking about when it comes to helping others. I definitely love giving more than receiving. In fact, I am a terrible gift receiver. (laughs) I just, I think I just love the joy of watching someone get so excited about getting a gift and thinking about that I thought about them to, to buy something that was really original or unique. I don't know. I just, I love that whole process. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love, I love getting gifts, (laughs) but I definitely get more joy giving them. And between all the holidays and gift giving, you might also have it on your heart to donate to a cause that you really believe in. But giving effectively, it isn't always easy. Our guest, Grace Nicolette, co-host of Giving Done Right podcast, 
and Vice President of Programming and External Relations at the Center for Effective Philanthropy, is here to help you figure out how to give effectively, whether it's now at the end of the year or whether you want to create a giving plan for next year. Grace answers some of your toughest questions like, how much do I give? Where should I give? And how do I know if I'm making a difference or if I'm actually doing more harm than help? I'm hoping this episode inspires you to think about giving in a different way and to really find an organization or cause that you deeply care about. It is true that even a little can make a big difference when it comes to giving. So let's start talking. You know, we've got so much going on in in the world and there's so many of us that really want to give to organizations we care deeply about making a difference. I was doing some uh, research for our conversation and I found some stats that were really interesting. It said in 2021, the largest source of charitable giving came from individuals who gave about $326 billion. I thought that was that was crazy. It kind of blew my mind. And mm-hmm. that was about 67% of total giving. And I've got so many questions for you that I, I want to talk about around giving. But to start things off, this is this is a question I really wrestle with quite often, no matter how much we have to give, you know, can we really make a difference when we give to organizations? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, and thanks for having me on your show. I think this is such an important topic because why, you know, why should we give if we're really not uh, going to be making a difference? And yet at the same time, I think that some of the problems that we're trying to solve or, you know, the issues that we care about are just so big and they really defy you know, easy solutions. Sometimes they're created by, you know, massive market failures or other (laughs) things like that. And so um, we also have to have a sense of humility around the ability for us to make an impact with the resources that we have, right? So we have to kind of right size our expectations. Um, So, I mean, I think where I would start is that there are a lot of needs in the world and it can be really overwhelming when we think about it. Um, you know, you open the paper and it's just, it kind of all floods in, or even just, you know, in our families or friend circles, you can just identify just a lot of needs out there. And so I would say, yes, we can make a difference and we should start somewhere, right? Like it's, um, it's true that we won't be able to solve every problem, but it's also true that we can actually make a difference so that one person, one gift can actually kind of move the needle. And especially, you know, to your point about the statistics, it's really like the collective coming together and giving, like we have each a a part to play with that. I think it's interesting because as you're talking, it makes me think about every year, my husband and I love the idea of, of giving and it almost creates like a sense of like paralysis where there's like you were saying there's so many places to give to yes that we almost don't know what to do and then a lot of times we end up not giving mm-hmm. and then we kind of feel bad about that but you know it's it's just sort of hard to sort through like well do i give locally do i give to a to yes. a big cause or to a friend is in need or you know and so i i think it's interesting i don't know maybe you probably see this a lot with giving where you just kind of get like you're in like a pause and you just, you just don't do anything. Yes. And I would say it's so common and totally understandable. Um, you know, something that, uh, my husband and I have done, you know, from the beginning of, um, after we got married is that we tried to really sit down and have a really intentional conversation about our giving goals. So like, what are the goals? Like, what should that local versus regional versus international mix be? And you know, what are some of the causes that we personally care deeply about? And it may not be the same, right, uh, by the person. And then, you know, we tried to just set some really rough um, rules of thumb or guidelines about how we would give. Um, for us, it's actually percentage of gross uh, earnings um, from our salaries. And then you know, we have tried to stick to that plan, um, but it also does require revisiting it year after year. And right. with the, the sense of overwhelm that you mentioned, I mean, one of the things that's worked for us is that we actually have a bucket that we can just be responsive. Like if someone asks us to support their nonprofit, we don't have to like, you know, wring our hands about it because there is sort of a bucket set aside to be responsive. And so I don't know if that helps, but that's, um, I find that to be 
kind of helping to relieve the pressure a little bit. I like that idea because, you know, when we talk about, I talk about building a spending plan, not a budget. And I talk about putting in the things that you love to do. If you love, you know, concerts or travel or whatever, like adding those in and and creating a a savings bucket for Mm -hmm. those. And so I like the idea that we could do it as well around giving and, you know, we could put money in kind of each month or each week or each quarter, however we want to do it. And we don't have to give it all at once or we could, I mean, but it just, I think it creates that atmosphere where we have this money, like let's, you know, let's find some place to give it to. Yes, absolutely. And it can be actually like a really amazing experience, right? It's like fun to kind of practice those generosity muscles, fun to do the research, fun to, you know, keep up with an organization or a community that you want to support. Yeah. So kind of along those lines, I think like my follow-up question is, I mean, this may seem obvious, but like, how does giving help us as individuals? Yeah. You know, I was actually just reflecting on the old truism, it's better to give than to receive um, this morning. And I think that like the data actually does bear that out, right? That when we give, we actually experience a lot of positive psychological effects in our brains. Um, But also it is a way that we are tied to other people. I think that we live in such a hyper individualistic society that we can think, okay, well, here I am with money and I'm going to give it to someone else in an organization that's supporting a cause or a group of people that, that lacks. Um, but really, I think that in my work, I've seen that it's actually a two way street that we are all sort of in community with each other, whether we recognize it or not. And it's a way for us to be connected Um, you know, emotionally invested uh, with our time and our resources into uh, other people's lives that can be good for us and kind of, you know, fill in the gaps in our lives because, you know, money, as you've said in other shows, I believe it's just like, it's not the only currency, right, that we have, that there's also relational currency, there's time and, you know, there's just a lot of things. So money isn't the only thing. I like that a lot. I like that idea of of community. I haven't really thought about that in terms of giving. It's interesting you're you're talking about givers versus receivers, and uh, you, my husband and I, like we're both givers. We Mm -hmm. love to like we love to throw parties for people and give uh, cards on their birthdays and all sorts of stuff. But we're both terrible receivers. (laughs) (laughs) So we make really good we make really good givers to organizations because that's just something that you know, is is naturally feels really good to us. But I would encourage anybody listening, if, if maybe you think you're a little bit more of a receiver than a giver, there's nothing wrong with that. But yes, you know, maybe, maybe try that a little bit. And I was, I was thinking about this, you host this co-host, this great podcast called Giving Done Right. Mm -hmm. You cover so many topics on your show. I really want to chat with you about a lot of those, but you know, you were talking about specific dollar amounts and, Mm -hmm. I would imagine that somebody listening is probably thinking like, well, isn't giving only for people who are wealthy? Like how much Mm -hmm. of a difference could I really make with a small amount of money? So, you know, how do we think about making a difference in terms of, you know, we might have just a few bucks or we might have a little bit more money to give? Yeah. You know, I guess my advice is that we should always start somewhere, right? Like, it's interesting that um, my observation is that the change and transformation for us as givers comes really after we've started the giving, right? Sometimes I think that there can be like a really big buildup to making certain (laughs) decisions. But actually, I think the reality is that, you know, obviously do your due diligence, find the causes um, that are legitimate and that um, that you care about, but, but then, you know, but then give. And I think it goes back to having that like right expectation of sort of the impact that we can have, you know, for any nonprofit, depending on the causes uh, that they're working on, they rely on a lot of individual donors to come together. And so while your dollars, if they are small, um, may not, you know, you may not be able to have attribution. Uh, it may not be reasonable for you to say, Oh, look, I gave you know, $25 a month to this charity that I care about, I would like to see the proof 
of the impact I have. I think that generally the nonprofit leaders can and should be able to tell you more broadly the impact that they're having that you are actually a part of. Now, individual attribution, I think, is difficult and I think um, is not necessarily a reasonable ask. Um, so I would say start somewhere. And and again, you know, if money is tight, sometimes it's not just about giving money, but it's also giving of your time, um, your connections, your resources um, that are beyond financial. And so uh, start somewhere. And, you know, one of the things I've said on our podcast is that some of the most generous people in the world are actually not necessarily high net worth givers. Right. So it's more of a posture than it is uh, actually having a ton of wealth. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news... Well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling, you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash TOS for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. 
And I love those stories being shared because I think they're very important stories because we can get kind of locked in this like I- idea that, yeah, we have to be making six figures or have a million dollars in the bank or whatever it might be. And so thinking about like some of the practicalities around giving, I'm wondering how do I figure out if I'm listening, like what type of organizations to give to? Is there a way to maybe vet out, you know, if an organization or a cause is worthy of the donation or maybe worthy is a bad, you know, not not the best word to describe, but really to like Mm -hmm. vet out organizations so that I know that my money is going to... Um, you know, a quality organization that's going to do something good, even if I'm only giving them 25 bucks. Yeah, I I would start with the causes that you care about. So some of that, you know, it's worthwhile to actually do some personal digging. So, you know, what are the things that really get me excited? Or if I think about my own background and upbringing, were there points or people along the way who really gave me a hand up. And so therefore I would love to give back in a similar way. And there's just any number of range of causes. I mean, especially in the United States, I think that's one of the lovely things about our civic life is that there's a plethora of different nonprofit organizations that are working on all sorts of things from really frontline direct service, you know, meeting people's needs, food banks, all of that to actually more like esoteric and kind of policy related nonprofits. So I would say take the time to do the research, to think about kind of what gets you really excited and then identify organizations that may work on those areas in ways that you resonate with. And and then I would say, you know, that due diligence piece, I would say GuideStar, you know, or Charity Navigator, those are a great um, sources Ooh, okay. you can go yeah. and look up their um, their tax filings. You know, read their annual reports, read up about their work. Um, certainly, if you're planning to give a larger gift, don't hesitate to reach out to the nonprofit to have a conversation and ask questions. Um, and then I would say, release the nonprofit to do their best work. You know, give a gift that isn't tied to a specific project that gives them the flexibility to work on the things that they need to work on. And the reason why I say this is that, especially during COVID, we saw that a lot of frontline nonprofits had to quickly pivot their work, right? So, you know, we spoke on our podcast to someone who works at a refugee resettlement agency in the state of Washington. And, you know, overnight they had to actually do a lot of food distribution because their communities were really Um, at risk of hunger uh, during the pandemic. And, you know, if they had had donors who had said, no, 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 I actually don't want you to spend your money on, you know, whatever the biggest need is, I want you to spend it on this X project (laughs) that I have my eye on. Yes, that's that's actually legitimate ask. But I think what I want to say to donors is that especially given the world that we live in, that flexibility for nonprofits can be really key. I like that. Like you find the organization that that you like that feels like a good fit for you, and then you you kind of release the organization, uh, yes. you know, so you're not you know like helicoptering over the organization. Yes, uh, I really like that. And so a couple more, just kind of like practical bits. I, I want to ask you, you know, is it better to give cash or put donation on a credit card, or is there is there a you know quote unquote right way to give your donation? That's a great question. I would say cash or cash equivalents are usually the most helpful. So, you know, I would say in recent years, there's been a lot more news articles and stories out there about how, for instance, when you're supporting a food bank, it's actually less helpful to kind of look in your own pantry and take out all the almost expired food and donate that. It's actually more helpful to give the food pantry cash because a lot of times, that food pantry knows what's most culturally appropriate for the people who are coming to them for services and can actually right, deploy okay. the cash uh, in the most useful way possible. Um, you know, there are ways in the United States in particular that we can give in like a tax advantaged way, right? So like whether you're giving appreciated stock or, you know, other ways like that. But, you know, I consider all of those like more or less like cash equivalents because the nonprofit will actually just take it, sell it, and then actually use use the cash for their operations. Um, if I may, one of the things that I want to bring up that is like an often um, misconception, I think, that donors have around giving to nonprofits is actually this whole idea of nonprofit overhead. 
And so, yeah. So basically, you know, we, I talk to a lot of donors um, and, you know, a lot of friends or just, I see this come up a lot in news articles where it's like, people are really fixated on the percentage that a nonprofit allocates to their like overhead and administrative costs. And the, the conventional wisdom is the lower that percentage is the better. And as with a lot of things in life and the world, the answer that we have is it really depends, right? Like there isn't one threshold. Like, so I've heard people say, oh, if they spend more than 10% on overhead, it's not a good nonprofit. And I would say that's a, that's a really wrong way of thinking. I think that in the business world, we want to make sure business is capitalized well so that they can, you know, produce their goods and services, retain good people to work for them. And, and that's actually very similar for a nonprofit too, right? You want to make sure that the nonprofit has strong operations, that they can afford to pay competitive salaries so they can retain their best people. Um, and I think sometimes there can be this sense of like, well, I just want my money spent on the impact part on the projects. I don't want any of it spent on overhead. And I guess I want to challenge donors to think more holistically um, and more long term about how a nonprofit can sustain itself. So if you have a chance to sustain a nonprofit by giving, please don't fixate on overhead. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member FDIC. You know, I like that you talk about misconceptions because... To me, there are just so many mm-hmm. misconceptions when it comes to giving. Uh, and you, as you were talking, it just reminded me that, you know, my family was always like mm-hmm. one of those families that helped people out. Like they would buy someone a hamburger outside of a restaurant or I don't know. They were just always a family that would like help people out. But yeah. I never saw my parents like donating to causes. And so... I just grew up thinking that donating to a cause was something that only the wealthy mm. people did. I don't know. Yes. I don't know quite how that kind of popped in my head, but that was just what I was thinking. And so, you know, as you talk about misconception, I'm thinking there are probably lots of other myths or just mm. false beliefs when it comes to donating. So, Grace, like what are some of the other common myths that you can kind of burst here for us? Totally. I'm so glad you brought this up. I mean, there are so many common misconceptions as people start their journeys of of becoming more serious givers. So we talked about overhead. We talked about, um, you know, sort of a a fixation on the impact of our particular giving um, vis-a-vis that, you know, the amount. I would say the other one that is very common these days is just a mistrust of nonprofits in general, right? Like that they are known, you know, there's a stereotype that they are sort of bloated, mismanaged, they're, they're just not as effective as organizations compared to for profit companies. And I think that's really untrue. I mean, a lot of this is like, what what gets covered in the media, right? Like, um, sometimes we do hear a lot about nonprofit scandals, but it's, it really is such a small proportion of the nonprofits um, are embroiled in scandal. And generally, you have you know, leaders and organizations who are just really dedicated and doing really great work in supporting the causes that they work on. So I would say, you know, not every nonprofit is going to be a good fit for what you're looking to do, but there are so many nonprofits out there that find the one that you resonate with and and really unleash them. Um, I think you also bring up a great point around like, you know, especially in the U.S., I think that like talking about money is you know, as, as you're the name. Yeah, it's so sensitive. And I feel like, you know, from sort of my religious upbringing, there's like that saying, like, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing when it comes to giving. And I think that there's like something to that in that, you know, a lot of people use their giving as just like a PR stunt. But I also think that there can be a lot of value in like talking about it and 
you know, normalizing the conversation around giving and bringing people along. I was actually just talking to a high net worth donor last week that, um, you know, he sees that a lot of his friends have a lot of fun sitting on the sidelines right now, and he sees a lot of needs in the community. So he's actually trying to create community around some causes that he cares about and like sort of bring folks along on a journey with him. And so I think that's really powerful. Um, and so if there's ways that um, we can be careful and keep our egos in check, but there there really can be like a power in kind of sharing and, and normalizing that, you know, giving is important. You know, we talk a lot on this show about money stories and how our money story is just mm-hmm. really the blueprint for our relationship with money. And I believe it's just interwoven yes. with how we were raised, our families, our money beliefs, society, culture, just all of that really makes up our money story. And you had this guest on your podcast talking about stories. He talked about like where we come from and our ancestors and common struggles and how our stories can really impact our giving. I thought it was so fascinating. I would love for you to just tell us more about this power of like unearthing our stories and how we can use our stories to create giving with impact that like really means something to us. This is um, such an opportunity, I think, for us. And oftentimes, I think we don't necessarily make that connection um, that our giving can actually be that personal. And and for a lot of people, I think they don't want it to be that personal, right? That maybe their past is is painful in some way. But the episode that you're referring to, um, we had these uh, husband and wife couple on who are high net worth donors. The husband was a refugee from Vietnam, rescued off of a boat in the South China Sea by this U.S. nonprofit, World Vision. And then, you know, fast forward several decades later, when he's a successful doctor, he's actually, you know, he was actually asked to be on the board of that organization. And so this is just such a powerful story to me. But, you know, he shares about how he was always trying to um, reach a level of security in his life, right? Arriving in the U.S. as refugees and money was always super tight. He had like a ton of siblings. His parents didn't make very much money. And I think that like, instead of sort of separating that out and saying, okay, well, that's who I was then. I'm really different now. And now I have this persona as being the successful doctor. He actually did go back and really mine that and understand like, you know, he went back to Vietnam to visit the ref, like, you know, uh, relatives that actually didn't leave. He um, talked to his family about, you know, his values and where they came from. And he also in his, he has a book talked about how even in his um, parents and grandparents generation, there was this like thread of generosity and giving um, even when times were really tough. So I think that all of us may have some starting points to kind of dig into a little bit more, right? About our family histories, about our own personal experiences. Like I said before, was there someone that gave us a hand up? Um, Was there some pivotal kind of thing that happened to us that makes us believe that certain things are really important. And so I think that to your point about the narratives, it's like we can really explore what narratives we have around giving and are there any threads that we can pull through that can be really generative in this conversation. So speaking of stories, I would love to hear a little bit about your own money story and kind of your journey Mm -hmm. into philanthropy and how you were like, okay, this is my passion and this is what I want to do all day, every day. Yeah. You know, for me as well, um, I can kind of trace a thread of generosity through my family. So uh, my grandparents on both sides were refugees uh, during the war in China that fled to Taiwan um, right after World War II, arrived with nothing. I mean, both of my parents grew up in abject poverty. Um, my mom didn't have like her first apple until she was in college. Um, and And my dad, you know, basically there was sort of an informal kind of giving system where neighbors would always be helping each other out with money. You know, his schooling fees in middle school were actually paid for by another family. Also didn't have a lot, um, but, you know, he experienced that generosity. And so it's been really interesting because on my grandparents' generation, on both sides of the family, there really is this like generous spirit of giving despite not having a lot. 
And then after my parents came to the United States, they came here for grad school and then they stayed. Um, and then, you know, my brother and I um, both grew up here. I think that I can definitely see that thread, right? Like they really had nothing. And there were so many people along the way who helped them along. And it really is that feeling of like, you know, why me? Like, why do I get all of these, um, why do I get to experience all of these, the blessings of being in the United States, uh, having an education, having a great job, um, when so many before me didn't get to experience that. And and it, in me, it generates a sense of gratitude and of wanting to also help others any way that I can. Um, and so there's always kind of been this sense in my mind. And basically, I, like many people who work in philanthropy, I mean, there are grad school programs out there, but most people kind of back into it, and which, which is what happened with me. I was working a finance job in New York. 9-11 happened. It really deeply affected me, like on a personal and spiritual level, because I was working um, very close to the the, the the Twin Towers and had to like run uptown. And it really made me question like my purpose in life, right? I, I had this great finance job. Um, I had actually been wanting to live overseas and just kind of try that out. And I did eventually move to Shanghai and worked there for about seven years. And while working a finance job there, I was volunteering on the side um, with all these different nonprofits and causes and getting really into it. And then there really was this moment where I thought, I want this to be more than just my side hobby. I, I actually would love to at least try dipping my toe into doing this full time. And so a group of friends and I, we actually started a nonprofit in Shanghai. And boy, that was such a trial by fire experience. I mean, nonprofit leaders have all my respect. It was definitely one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life and uh, gave me a deep appreciation for just the importance that nonprofits uh, have in our society. And, and also just like the importance that donors can support them. And so when I moved back to the States, uh, 2011, um, I wanted to kind of continue my career in philanthropy because I think that unleashing people's generosity is just good all around, right? For the communities that people are supporting, but also for donors themselves. And it's such a vital part of our civic life. And so, yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's been my journey. I love that. I love that you mm -hmm. just followed your passion because I would imagine that you probably gave up like a pretty sizable paycheck to enter into the nonprofit world. But what you're saying is, is like, it's just as important to give yeah. to causes that we believe in, mm -hmm. but it's also important to just give, I think, the best gift to ourselves. And sometimes that means taking the job or the career path that just really lights us up and maybe doesn't always make the most financial sense. Yes. And, you know, I feel like there's like no black and white answers, right, in this, because it's like, you know, I talk to a lot of young people who are really wrestling with their career choices and, and money decisions around, okay, so should I pursue purpose in, let's say, working for a nonprofit, or should I, you know, try to make as much money as I can so then I can give it away? And so, you know, the giving part will be sort of um, outside of working hours. And I think that there really isn't like a black and white answer, which I, which I love, right? Because I feel like that would not be, um, <laughs> you know, every person's situation is so different. One of the guests that we had on this season was um, this woman named April Tam Smith, who's a managing director at a major investment bank in New York City. And I just, I highly recommend that episode. It's actually the most popular episode we've had of all time because she, you know, has decided to stay at an investment bank, even though she is so involved with all these different causes. Um, and she just has decided to be like a very different kind of financial professional. And so there was a time that she and her husband were actually giving away 90% of their income and living on 10%. Um, yeah, and then they also decided um, after that season of life to open a vegan fast casual restaurant in Times Square that uh, employs people who need a second chance and they give all the proceeds away to nonprofits. So I think that there's just, there are some really creative people out there who are doing life in ways that I think can be really inspirational to those of us who are still trying to figure things out. Like how do I live with purpose? Where does career 
fit in, where does giving, where does family, all of that. Um, I just want to encourage folks that there are lots of people who are asking the same questions and um, and doing pretty cool things. So um, I hope that can be encouraging to to your listeners. So we're coming up here on the holiday season, and I'm just wondering if the holidays are like when most people give or when you should give, or does it make sense to give, mm-hmm. you know, kind of throughout the year, not just like wait until the end of the year to like give your donation? That's an excellent question. In the United States, because of the way that our tax system works, um, traditionally everyone, not everyone, a lot of people wait until the end of the calendar year to give, which if you talk to nonprofit leaders, you know, they've come to expect it, right? So um, yes. And and now we have Giving Tuesday, which is usually the Tuesday after Thanksgiving every year. And that's like a really big date on nonprofits calendars. I mean, I think the thing is, you know, nonprofits need to be sustained all year long. Um, if you want to give them a one-time gift at the end of the calendar year, that's great. Um, oftentimes, I would just recommend asking them, like, what would be most helpful? And um, it's never too late to start. So if, you know, come January 1, you're like, oh, man, I missed the boat. I would say don't wait until the end of the year. You can still um, have those conversations and, and make the gift. No nonprofit leader is going to say to you, Oh yeah, sorry, you missed the boat. (laughs) That's, it's not going to happen. Um, so yeah, it, you know, anytime is a great time, especially given the needs now. I just think that, um, you know, being decisive and just taking action is the most important. The reality is there are just like a lot of tugs on our wallets these days. And, It looks like it's just not going to get any easier in the coming months. But if we really get really serious about about giving and we're passionate and we're inspired with this episode, how do we create a giving spending plan so we can really help an organization that we love, but we can also do it in a way that feels really comfortable to our own kind of budgets and lifestyle? I would say, I think that the intentionality is what it comes down to, right? Like, there will be lots of things um, that we need to focus on financially, especially when there's so much uncertainty in the economy. And especially when so much of us, many of us are really struggling financially. Um, I would say if you can have that conversation, whether with your family members or just your own conviction around the intentionality of the place that giving has within your spending, um, I think that really is more than half the battle. Um, There is something really unique that happens that even when we are stretched financially, but we still give, I think that there is something that that is really special that can happen. Um, Whether that's tying us more in community with others in solidarity with other people, whether it, you know, even just has some throw off effects of of more discipline around other areas of our spending. Um, You know, we can always look at people that are less fortunate than we are and could use um, a helping hand, whether financial or otherwise. And so I think that if we can, we should. Um, But it is highly personal and there is no uh, right or wrong answer. I can't say to you the right answer is you should give this percentage. It's both the head and the heart um, and, you know, up to you as who you are as an individual, what communities you are in and how you can best get involved. I'm so inspired from this episode to get more in tune with my story and I don't know, just figure out ways that I can give that feel more attached to kind of who I am and maybe even my family's history. I just find all of that super fascinating because I know sometimes when I give, it can just kind of feel like, okay, I'm just I'm just giving some money. I don't know. There isn't really like a a big feeling attached to it or a passion or something that gets me super excited. So when Grace was talking, I just got really inspired to think about giving in a different way and to think about, you know, as we go into next year, like how I want to really reshape my giving plan. And I hope you were inspired to do the same. If you're interested in checking out her podcast, a lot of the episodes that we talked about on this show, you can find her podcast, Giving Done Right, on any podcast player. And you can also find her at the Center for Effective Philanthropy. There are lots of resources for donors. And if you're just kind of new to this idea of donating, there's just a lot of resources. You can go to CEP. 
www.thepowerofpositivityshow.org. As always, if you enjoyed this episode, share it with someone else who might want to kind of bring in a little bit of uh, more of a donation spirit, we'll just call it, uh, next year. As always, you can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guests, as well as the amazing sponsors that make this show possible. I'll see you back here in a few days for a brand new episode. (music) 